Hey, Melissa, welcome. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk with you. Yeah, uh, looking forward to our conversation here today. Let's just get started. And if you could share briefly so that everyone knows and hears from your own words, you know, what does MVW Communications do? Yeah, so MVW Communications is my boutique public relations focus consultancy. We're an agency based out of San Antonio, Texas here in the U.S., but we serve clients across the nation, just depending on what the communication goal campaign or really need is. So sometimes under MVW, we, we operate very agilely um, or nimbly, and I can be straight one-on-one -on -one consultant to a client. I can coach them up for a big public speaking event, for example, or a big mm -hmm. interview. I coach teams and uh, host workshops and trainings to shore up some skills that maybe an internal communication or PR marketing team might need. We put together strategic comms plans for clients, and sometimes that's that do-it-yourself guidebook we'll put together for your team, for example, to bring right. to life over the course of a campaign. And then we do professional done-for-you type services like a lot of public relations agencies do. So that mm. can run the gamut of strategic comms planning and then activating and making sure that campaign comes to life. That can be kind of focused on one part of communication like media relations or can be PR strategy or that people first point of view on really all assets and and um, the marketing suite in general. So mm. the work is very diverse and it has yep. been since I started it in the, the field 20 years ago. And that's what I really love about it is that it is something that evolves and changes along with society. Mm. But I find that public relations is so important because it's really about building these mutually beneficial relationships that are really good for everyone and hopefully are built to stand the test of time. What, so what were you doing before, Melissa, before you got into PR, like starting your own you know, PR consultancy? Yeah. Um, what, what were you doing? And I'm wondering how that kind of led you to decide one day, you know what, I should start my own PR consultancy. Yeah, absolutely. So I started MVW in 2015. And before that, I had been a traditional employee. So the majority of my career had been a traditional employee. Um, so MVW has been open eight years. So the rest of that, right? I was uh, someone else's employee. And while I love that, and I love the natural mentoring that's available in uh, workplaces, one of the reasons I spun off and started my own firm was just a matter of happenstance. And I find that a lot of consultants or solopreneurs, independent practitioners, or big firm business owners start in a way that's kind of non-linear like that. So mm. um, I'm a working mother. I have two young children and keeping up and being a leader in public relations in a space that's quite dynamic. It can be quite volatile at times and yeah. uh, always different. I mean, the unprecedented we get here it usually comes from the mouths of PR people, right? Where sure. they want to kind of figure just, out. The take, take me back for a moment just to, yeah. to your days as an employee. Were you working deeply like in public relations in those roles as well? And, and if so, just kind of give everybody a little bit of a background, like what kind of companies were they? What were you doing inside of those organizations before you went out on your own? Yeah, so um, my career spanned really all the major types of organizations you could work for in the PR realm. So I had started a his very small micro boutique agency, much like mine today, and that was a very Hispanic or Latino focused agency. So we were culturally competent and mm -hmm. sensitive, and we really tailored for that community and all the PR marketing work we did. So that was agency first, then I went in-house at a nonprofit big brothers, big sisters of South Texas, a big region in our area, um, but with ties to big brothers, big sisters of America, and did a lot of the recruiting, marketing, PR type work there in media relations. Though there's certainly been a through line of PR throughout my career, um, but in a lot of my roles, I had to do everything. So mm. I transitioned from that into a corporation privately held here in Texas, HB Grocery Company. And HB is just fantastic at tailoring for different customers. So segmenting and understanding multicultural uh, groups and preferences was big there, is big there. And I worked in diversity and inclusion at mm. HB. So um, use those kind of connected the dots for the employers to see, hey, look, the multicultural marketing and PR efforts I use to recruit volunteers, right? More Hispanic or Latino big brothers to the nonprofit organization I was at. 
those strategies would be helpful in the corporate setting as well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if if you look at your career, every piece can be a building block if you think about it. Yeah. Just um, take me for for a moment. The the reason I'm asking is because like, as you mentioned, so you have worked in roles before you started your PR consultancy, right? right? You you had some PR, you had marketing, you had recruiting. um, So you weren't pure play, like, you know, very focused only on PR, right? You had a lot of different experiences. And I bring this up because a lot of consultants, when they go out into consulting, they have a similar backstory, right? They've worked in many different companies, many different industries. They have different skills, different kind of, you know, areas of expertise. And it can be very challenging to decide what to actually focus on and what to build a business around. So can you kind of take us back to that time, hit the rewind button? What made you decide to focus and actually build a PR consulting business as opposed to a more general, you know, marketing business, communications business, uh, diversity inclusion business. So you could have gone a lot of different right. ways. What made you decide to focus on public relations? Yeah, well, Michael, I'll tell you. So from HEB, then I went to the largest agency in our area, and that was PR focused type agency. But all of it together, the world is a uh, multi passionate. Right. There's um, multi factors to everything. And in PR, same thing. Public relations to me is a specific point of view where you're thinking about people and goodwill first, Mm -hmm. but everything else can be that that can be the umbrella underneath all the communication disciplines and tactics. So for me, that was always been my point of view, no matter what role I had. Um, So when I was looking to start my own business, which again, really happened because I needed to move locations. I needed to not be officing downtown in my city. I needed to Mm be remote in my, uh, closer to my kids' school. So for me- And this was before the the pandemic, right? Where everyone was uh, was remote. So I got you. Thank goodness I was ready for that, actually. (laughs) Uh, That had had trained me up. So I had started my remote business in 2015, remote from clients. You come in person when it matters. Otherwise, I've got time. I can save commuting time to do the work, right? But I focused on PR because that is such a passion point for me. I'm known for that. So my brand is naturally tied to public relations. Um, But then also, really, I know that it integrates well with diversity, equity, and inclusion, with marketing principles and tactics and strategies. It integrates well with a comprehensive plan, which would include advertising, social media strategy, paid social media buying, right? Mm -hmm. So it was more about that point of view and the principles led type work that I resonate with and that I was attracted to. And then naturally clients of that nature came to me. So to your point, a lot of us do a lot of everything because you want to, or you have to, but so you're kind of a generalist and over time, you'll find that you're uniquely valuable in one area of your work or another, Mm -hmm. or that you you start developing that specialized um, viewpoint or, or, um, you know, abilities. And so you become a specialist. So for me, the fact that I'd worked in employee communications as well as D&I was very different than most of my peers in PR. Most of them Mm -hmm. only did external comms. So they were always talking with the public, but never to the employees. And when I was at HEB, that was 90,000 plus employees with very diverse educational background, very diverse cultural backgrounds and preferences, right? Yeah. So that made me very unique. And I was able to identify that and um, put that in my talking points. And as far as a brand differentiator, that makes me kind of special. Right. Let me ask you, when when you decide that in 2015 to, to launch the business, to go out on your own, as you said, you know, you made that decision really from a lifestyle perspective based on family, right? Just kind of uh, prioritizing the, those things, uh, which makes complete sense and right is very common, right? Uh, in terms of why consultants actually go out on their own and, and start a business. But where did your first few clients come from? So you, you've you decided, okay, I have this mm-hmm. diverse set of experiences, but I'm going to build a PR consulting business. It's just you to begin with. What what do you do? Take me back to, the, to that day. Where are the first, you know, two, three clients come from? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my very first client was the employer I had at the time, KGB Texas. Uh, KGB was a wonderful place to work. I wasn't really looking to move on, but life happened. My kids needed to move to schools in my Mm -hmm. side of town. And I knew as a PR leader, it would be very hard for me to make it to their daycares and schools on time from where I was officed at. So as a matter of um, talking with the agency owner at the time, it's like, look, we can keep the consistency here for your clients. I have your email, right? We have cell phones. 
And, and really, we can just transition from that traditional employee to contractor. Agencies mm-hmm. often work with a lot of different independent pros and contractors. So sure. I've seen and learned from, from their backgrounds and lifestyles and said, you know, I, I can still do great work. I just need right. to not always hear. Got and it. at that time, the community wasn't quite ready for more remote type workers and leaders. So, you know, that was the compromise we kind of made. So I was able to continue on their good work and work with them. Um, But as soon as I was essentially, you know, out on my own, you just start sharing your story. Mm -hmm. And I had done a lot of deep work with trade associations in my space. So very active member of the Public Relations Society of America. Um, Now I'm a national columnist for them. So that helps with lead generation. But at the time, just locally, and yeah. so people knew my name and knew my reputation outside of any workplace I was at, yeah. which is Let, a part for people. And let me ask you, Melissa, on, on that, because um, I mean, really what you're talking about is you so you had all these relationships, right, that you yes. had been investing in over time, which is very, very powerful, right? can be very effective. Uh, you also, so your first employer, or sorry, not your first employer, your first client was a previous employer, which we've seen in our studies, that's actually the case 50% of the time when people wow. you know, go out, go out into consulting, but um, I'm, I'm wondering what did you do? So you had these relationships, you have your, the first client as a previous employer, but in order to get the second client, third client, fourth client, and so on, it sounds like you did something with, with your network. You didn't just wait for people to come to you. Yeah. Did you, did you send an email? <laughs> did you make phone calls? Did you go to events and tell people what yeah. were, what did you actually do? So, and I'm asking from the position of, for those that might be earlier stage, we're going to have consultants listening to this and joining us who, you know, are much further along running, you know, multi-million dollar businesses and so forth. But for others who are earlier stage, um, or maybe opening up a new market, share with us what you did in, so that it could maybe help them. Yeah. So especially if you transition with an employer and they become your first client, you want to honor them and, and be careful about how you do that. But essentially, yeah, hit the ground at the very next professional event. I sent emails from my new established brand email to non-compete type um, leads, right? So friends that I knew in the business, hey, Michael, so great to, you know, blah, 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 see your kids, blah, 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 on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'm out on my own now. Here's information about my firm. Here's my website. So while I was preparing to go off on my own, I gave my employer a couple months notice. And then I prepared behind the scenes, got my website ready to go, got a brand ready to go. I didn't want to be a white label type pro, meaning that I didn't have my own brand identity because I know how important that is for clients when they're making their considerations of, can you advise me? Well, I have to at least look the part, I'll look like I have that experience in my portfolio. So website is your home base, make that first so that you can share that via email. So once you are out on your own, then you can sh- send an email to your network, post something on social media, especially LinkedIn, mm. and then have those coffee toss, coffee Zooms nowadays, right. um, and then go to industry and events. So not only for your industry, but those that could use your help that don't have a pro like you. So I also went to marketing association and advertising association type events because they were all marketers, but they didn't have a PR pro. So now we can Mm. partner together. So there's a lot of um, B2B partnering that happens too, where they have a skill set or a sweet spot and I do too. And we can come together like Avengers and then Mm. break apart when the campaign no longer needs that partnership. You mentioned that you uh, write for a column for yeah. the PR, it was the PR Association. Uh, PRSA, of- the Public Relations Society of America. Yes. Got you. Um, share a little bit of how, how that came to be. I- I'm thinking you know, about everyone who's joining us who might be in manufacturing or pharma, like essentially every industry has their own trade association or you know professional group where if your ideal clients are reading those publications or they're members of, of those groups, uh, it could be a very interesting or you know effective way to generate leads and create more conversations and build your authority. So I guess, number one, Melissa, has that been uh, a good way for you to build your business? Uh, or if not, why do you do it? And then just second to that, I'm wondering, how do you actually go about landing or kind of securing that regular column? Yeah, I would highly advise anyone give it a try because thought leadership is very powerful in terms of shaping and influencing your own brand. And no matter what size your company is or isn't, it all starts with that human who started the the company, right? So what is Mm -hmm. your reputation? What do people know about you? And part of that is really showing your work. So thought leadership is creating content that 
shows that expertise. And so for me, I actually reached out to the uh, to PRSA, raised my hand and said, hey, look, I've noticed you've been talking about diversity and inclusion for a number of years. You are you know, most highly regarded in the public relations space. And I learn from you each month as a member, but there's no one that looks like me. There's no Latino or Hispanic representation in terms of your columnist or that mm. has regular piece in your magazine that can share learnings with other practitioners. Yeah. So I really was inspired during the pandemic to be bolder because like, if not now, when, right? Yeah. I could die from COVID. So let me just go ahead. And instead of complaining behind the scenes, I just raised my hand and said, hey, I've got a body of work. You can take a look at it. I came to PR as a published creative writer. So the writing really helps me and continues to help me and the clients. But mm -hmm. I wanted to be that representation. I wanted yeah. to inspire others. But I do want to be very clear that often we don't get tapped, particularly if you are different than the majority in your community, different in any way. You may not be naturally thought of. So mm -hmm. you have to be a little more courageous and say, let me give that a try. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and so, so what happened? So you sent the email, which I think is, first of all, it's great that you took the initiative to do that. I love that idea of being bolder and, you know, going for things that maybe typically you, you wouldn't. So, you know, hats off to you on, on that. It's fantastic. Uh, but what happened? You sent, you sent one email and was there a response right away or did it require multiple follow-ups? Kind of what did that look like? Sure. The editor actually emailed me back. He was probably happy that I, I sent a note with a solution versus just a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've all been around council culture long enough to know that most people are just complaining. <laughs> so uh, I said, hey, you know, I'm happy to write for you. And so he said, you know what? That sounds great. Can you write a piece about how you're dealing with everything during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. So my very per first piece was the personal side of uh, public relations during a pandemic. Yeah. And it was very much behind the curtain of Oh, yeah, I'm, you know, having moments where I'm wondering how I can handle all this, too. I had a son in kindergarten that was learning now on Zoom and a daughter in fifth grade and PR clients who were asking me, what do we do? What do we do? So actually, the pandemic was a time where my business really took off and started thriving. One, because I got more, I got bolder because I was mm -hmm. afraid, you know, something might happen. But two is I I really felt like it was very clear that our community needs advisors and counselors during this time. They need real guidance and mm -hmm. how to communicate something that's so vitally important that people could live or die based on their interpretation of the information. Yeah. And, you know, I love marketing. I love advertising, but they don't have that kind of guidance that real accredited PR pros live by. So that really uh, stuck out to me is, gosh, we got to double down on PR principles to make it through this chaotic time and to calm things down in a very noisy mm -hmm. um, and raw, you know. What, what happened when you, so you published that first piece, um, what happened? Did like, did the phones yeah. just start ringing off the hook or so they, was it? They, uh, <laughs> as, as far as PR say, they followed up with me, loved it. You know, can you try another piece? So I wrote something that. For there's a lot of misunderstandings about the Hispanic and Latino communities in the US and then beyond. Mm -hmm. So I really dug into data and, and gave an update on terminology in this space um, as a pro. And then they asked me, invited me to be a regular columnist for the next calendar year. And I've been such since, but I really have a lot more autonomy. I had autonomy to name it. So I call it cultural strategy because I really want to flex within just how to work with different types of people in a lot mm -hmm. of different ways. Um, but yeah, I started getting a lot of inquiries and requests and follows on LinkedIn pretty much instantly. People resonated with my story or my point of view on things in my writing. And there was pros coming out of the woodwork from across the country. So really before I had not had such a great reach out of San Antonio or my home base. Right. A lot, oftentimes in public relations, people just think about media relations, which is working with journalists and building relationships there. But it's only one aspect of our work, certainly a specialty and it is yeah. challenging. Um, and I'm known for that, too. But that's only because I'm people oriented. Right. Mm. And I'm good at building relationships. So. Normally, if you're a media relations pro, they'll think about you. Okay, when I need something in Chicago or San Antonio or, or where you live, we'll contact you. So that limits your market share um, and work availability. But once I had this column and this people were seeing me and connecting with me through LinkedIn and starting to follow me on different social media platforms that 
it was so affirming that the representation did matter to people, that a different point of view was helpful, mm -hmm. and that being strategic in where you place yourself and put your time against can really help your business. Is there anything else that you're doing right now from a kind of marketing or lead generation perspective that you yeah. feel is really making a big impact and you know helping to grow the business currently? Yeah. So I have a podcast and that one I actually set up very carefully too, to be a series. So that way, as the host and the funder for it, initially, it could have a nice bookmark open and close date, right? So each series is a season. So mm. we just finished um, season six. So if I don't publish another one, it seems complete. It wasn't an open-ended thought. That's been helpful mm -hmm. in, in terms of just really authority. It's mm -hmm. been surprising, I'm sure, to you too. People, you'll run into them and they're like, oh, I listen to your podcast. And you really won't know by the listener downloads or data, but the intimacy in that channel is very powerful. You're literally in someone's ears. And so that trust building has, seems to leapfrog some um some time. Yeah. And the other one I really am excited about, as you can see a little subtle marketing back here, is I published a book this last year and it's called Smart Talk um, Public Relations Essentials All Pros Should Know. Because I'm sure you see it in the news every day where you're at, Michael. People do some funny things and funny, not haha. -ha. <laughs> so they do some uh, impulsive things. And when you're a top leader or you're a business owner, there's really no room for impulsivity in good work, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be very um, logical. And when emotions get high, whether that's because it's a little too late on night to be late at night to be posting on social, or maybe you're angry or you've got a terrible review or a terrible customer um, incident, or you're having a personal life drama, right? We have to really be strategic and disciplined as business owners and leaders to really think before we act and mm. before we post and before we say anything, before we write anything, because the whole world's a stage. Everything's broadcast tool nowadays, even our phones. And we have to respect the world we're in and, and evolve with that. So I think as a PR pro, the greater the reach and the more Thomas the advice, like I think I'm really going to go far there. And I love the teaching aspect of this work. Yeah. Your business is really positioned from an outside perspective, it's about you. Like you're, 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 you know, a key part in the brand. Um, you know, you look at the website, right. It's, it's mm -hmm. really about you. I'm wondering why structure your business that way. So there's no right or wrong, right. Everyone does what's, what is right for them and what model they want and what they want to create. Some people choose and they're, you know, very intentional about building a team from day one or making it much bigger than, than just what they can provide as a solo consultant you've that's the model that you've gone with right in terms of just the brand is you it's just take me into that that thinking and to better understand why have you structured the business the way that you have today yeah it's a really smart question um definitely did it with intention so i think everything we do should be thoughtfully done and i did it literally with my initials mvw because starting right out look i wasn't trying to be a big bad agency a big bad firm i didn't want a lot of overhead I just wanted more location flexibility in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And now as I get a little bit older, my kids get older and want more of my time and need it, a little more time flexibility. And so if it's built on me, one, I knew, well, I could always trust myself because no matter where I worked, like I was often very fast and trustworthy and very creative and, you know, had the big ideas. So I knew that, look, I'd come with it. And the pros that I wanted to hire, I wanted to be contractor only model. So that again, I had flexibility. When the pandemic mm -hmm. hit, we lost a little bit of business, but I doubled down on, hey, here's how we pivot. Here's how we reimagine your events. Here's what we do, guys, follow me. And it was like Pied Piper, people followed along. But I want contractors who are really in it because they're experts of what they do. They mm -hmm. care about the work. They don't need me micromanaging them. And um, they just want to come together, do great work and move on when it's organically time. So I appreciate that. I think it's a very accessible way for anyone to start a business. And if you have a good reputation, you're willing to do the work to keep that reputation going. And it, that aligns with your personal life, too. I will be clear on that, that I think that you'll, you'll have a very solid foundation. Yeah. So as a solo consultant, right, you bring in contractors for for projects and so forth as you need them. One of the the challenges that some people will face is that 
you can't create more time, right? And there's a lot that needs to to often get done. What do you, I'm wondering, is there any kind of best practices or uh, a model, uh, a framework that you use to make decisions about how you spend your time inside of the business so that you're not necessarily, you know, held back uh, by things that you just you just end up doing because you're looking to be productive, but those don't necessarily add value for for the business. So how do you just think about the relationship between you know, working on the business and the time that you have available. Yeah, I think that's just certainly a growth opportunity for everyone. And we can, I continue to learn and, and read more and listen to podcasts like yours to get better at that, quite frankly, Michael. So for me, I've, I've come to a place this year where I, the book launched last October. And so I told my team, so I have a pretty consistent contractor team yeah. and um, they're loyal and supportive, right? No matter what their IRS information or filing number is. And so with, with me, I said, look, this book is like a new baby and I need to nurture it and give it the kind of support that we would advise any client. You, you put that work and investment into it, like you got to make it worth something, right? And so for me, I've been really tinkering this year of how can I optimize things? How can I put together that systematic approach on different tools or even just let's document everything. Here's our approach to how we do media relations. And we always follow these key steps for it. Here's a framework for, of you know, putting together even like recaps for clients, right? Because those can be very important in our work mm -hmm. of what we do and don't do. So documenting the heck out of everything, leaving behind all the breadcrumbs easy to find. And then for me is looking for like, what can I, what kind of intellectual property can I create that'll live beyond me? One, so it's helpful to people in the future, but two, that's a little more scalable. So that is where the book came from is because I was often asked for advice and I didn't have a lot of time for that one-on-one -on -one coaching all the time for pros who didn't want to tell their employer they didn't know how to do something or they weren't sure about something. They wanted that guidance, but they didn't have a large budget like a, a larger client would. Um, but then also I'm looking at digital, like creating a digital course. So again, the workshops that I'm doing in person in my community I'm being flown out in another market to do it. But again, that's a lot of lift for different organizations to pay for, especially in today's economy is can I make something that's a little uh, more asynchronous that you can do from home or at work and that lives beyond me and I film it and get it perfect and that front load is heavy but after that it's an easy lift right we just promote it um, so I am considering that too so I think you know really looking at how do you monetize some of your skills and thought leadership in a way that systematically is rinse and repeat and refine would be helpful yeah so that's great. I appreciate you sharing that. You're now, I guess, about nine years right in into the business. Um, almost, yeah, almost I guess, almost ten years, right? 2015. So, well, 2015. oh no, sorry. So yeah, eight years, eight years. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, yeah, I love it. <laughs> living in the future. Um, so I, I'm wondering, as you think about again the business, you, I mean, you shared kind of how you position or how you go about kind of making decisions around allocating your time uh, within the business of where you spend it. But as, as you shared, right, you know, your, your mother, two children, um, mm -hmm. any kind of rules that you've set for yourself or guidelines that, that you've instituted to find that kind of balance between, and not that it has to be any kind of balance, but I'm just wondering, how do you think about um, working inside the business and still you know, being a mother, being present, uh, and yeah, any rules that, that you use that you found to be helpful in yeah. setting that kind of structure? Well, one, if I don't like it and I hate it or it bores me, I don't do it. Like mm -hmm. I have no poker face. You know exactly how I'm feeling. I'm very energetic and passionate and people enjoy that. But if I don't like it, it's like, if my brain will literally not retain the information. So there's some sectors I'd love to do more work in, but it literally is like, nah. so it bores me. So I, I just don't even try. Yeah. Um, so if it doesn't excite me, I referred on, but I figured out a way also to have like a referral um, type model with a different partnering uh, folks so that if they can benefit from it, great. And maybe I get a little percentage of that as a, ref a finder fee and that's great, right? It's a little something. Um, but then two is, I look, I think about integration. So how can I add this to my life? How can I add my kids into the work I do? So I I've tend to work with a lot of family friendly type organizations or brands. So if there was a way to involve my daughter, who's the eldest, for example, and she can shadow me or support me or go on site, she's learning the business while I get an extra pair of hands. 
And then I have the model for this photo or the video, or I can, you know, use her as part of an asset that I can provide a client, for example. And she's learning and growing, right? So I look for that integration. Writing the book was a huge challenge. A lot of it I wrote speaking, talk to text while walking the dog. So I was taking care of my exercise and fitness and getting a little me time as a mom and quiet time, as well as taking care of like the creative thoughts I had, right? The hardest part was editing it where you have to actually sit down and, and have some computer desk time, in which yeah. my, my husband helped me with that, watching the kids on weekends and stuff. But I try to think like, is this something that I'm proud of, that it helps others, that I feel good spending my time on? You know, and I think we do have leverage as business owners to think that way once we've got that brand reputation and specialties down. So I think you'll also notice that you attract different types of clients based on how you communicate or what they see really uh, excites you and what you're good at. So at this point, we've really figured out at MVW that our specialty kind of sectors and who we can help the most are nonprofits because we just love that work, right? Very mm. mission driven people, very values driven people. We love education clients because we feel like that is a root solvent for a lot of issues in our communities. And it can be very democratizing for folks. The more education they get, the better off they do. We're behind that. And as well as for profits, who just want to do some kind of good. You know, mm. if you're really just selling a widget and you want some PR for it, I'm like, that's great. Buy some advertising because you're not going to earn any media relations for that widget. Unless, again, there's some kind of resourceful, helpful nature to that product or widget. And yeah. so, yeah, I think that I'm able to kind of be authentic because people see a consistency in what I talk about or show that I care about both in like the work type, right, positioning that I do, but also the personal live channels that I, I hold. And I'm very thoughtful about my engagement on social media as well, because what we do online, whether or not, you know, we're on the clock or off, it all is the same for people. Yeah, I think it's so important, as you mentioned, to be very clear about what kind of work you want to do at, at the same time, you know, even more important, what kind of work you, you don't want to do, or what kind of people or clients, or organizations, right, uh, uh, resonate with you and, and those that don't. And I really like your point about integrating and bringing, you know, your kids into the picture. I think with my, my two daughters and just even this weekend, I was working on something real quick. And I said, you know, do you guys want to maybe record a little something with me? And um, it didn't work, but we we still uh, had a good laugh about it, and uh, I look forward to doing you know more of that as they as they get older as well. So, uh, Melissa, I want to thank you so much for for coming on here today, just sharing you know a little bit of of your story. Uh, I know people can learn a lot more from the different resources you have, your podcast, your book, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, what's the website address for people to go to so they can check it all out? Yeah, yeah, you can learn about me and the work we do at mvw360.com. And I call it 360 because we really take a 360 degree approach to any communication challenge or problem. And I appreciate what you're doing, Michael, and really introducing and unpacking this type of work for society because I think more than ever, right? Being your own consultant, being your own boss is more accessible than ever. And you just wanna make sure that you put together the right kind of package and credentials and, and effort so that you do that in a very smart strategic way. Yeah, thanks so much, Melissa. Yeah, thank you.